Before we read the story together, it's very helpful to get a little context. God had freed the Israelites from their slavery in Egypt, and then after they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they settled into the promised land. As they, just as they were moving into the promised land, Moses had been the first judge that had ruled over them. But once they settled into Canaan, they were ruled by a series of 12 judges. You can see that list up on the screen. And those uh, <clears throat> judges ruled over the next few centuries. And then, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, the people wanted a king so that they could be like the other nations. And so, again, you can see it on the screen. There is this list. I know it's hard to read the actual names. For some of you, perhaps... But the, it began with uh, King Saul, and then from there, you can see those in the green, uh, went to David and Solomon, and then the kingdom was divided into two nations, Judah in the south, Israel in the north. Our story is about Ahab, who was the seventh king of Israel, highlighted in the blue on the left-hand side around 874 B.C., Leading up to our story in 1 Kings 16, verse 29, Ahab had already been described as the evilest king that the Israelites had ever known. He reigned for 22 years. He married Jezebel, who was the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And then he served and worshipped Baal. That's one of the figurines from those early days and set up an altar for Baal so that the nation would worship in, uh, him instead of God as well. 1 Kings 16 verse 33 records that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now at the same time, Elijah was God's prophet, primary prophet at that time. He wins the battle uh, with the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. I think I preached on that text a few years ago already. He ultimately executes all of those prophets. Jezebel swears that she is, because of that, going to kill Elijah, but he escapes. And then in chapter 20, King Ben-Hadad and the Syrians, they gather up a huge force of men to take over the northern kingdom ruled by Ahab. On the left-hand side, you can see how the, uh, <clears throat> the kingdom is divided into two with the northern in the blue. <clears throat> and Ahab, just as Ben-Hadad comes in, to uh, take over this territory the, of <clears throat> Ahab, he decides he's just going to surrender. Give it all to him. The elders and a prophet tell him, God will help you if you will fight. And so he does indeed do that, defeats the Syrians twice. And this is, um, <clears throat> they would have come up from the northeast, come down trying to take over the, this territory and uh, after he defeats them twice, <clears throat> they do so significantly, leaving Ben-Hadad virtually alone. Ben-Hadad pleads for mercy. Contrary to God's command, Ahab decides to be a nice guy. Makes a treaty with him, sends him away safely. And then God declares... <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, because you have let go out of your hand the man whom I had devoted to destruction, therefore your life shall be for his life and your people for his people. And the king of Israel, this is Ahab, went into his house, vexed and sullen, and came to Samaria. So he's moping at home. Then some time passes and we get into our story. You all know as you've been to movies in the past, that they, there is this rating system for movies. And if our particular story was converted into a movie or a TV show, this is what it would be rated. Violence, probably a lot of bad language to go with it. 
And our story illustrates some of the worst of evil that is recorded in Bible times. It's interesting to note as well that back in the 1990s, this city and palace at Jezreel in Samaria was excavated. Perhaps it's still being excavated. On the upper right is the uh, old wine press. And uh, this is some of the areas where uh, the palace was. And this is the entire town or city that is being excavated. So now let's read it together. And bear with me, it's 29 verses. I typically don't read 29 verses. Didn't know how to not read 29 verses. So let's do it together. Now, Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because if it is near my house, I will give you a better vineyard for it. And if it seems good to you, I'll give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. And Ahab went into his house vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down in his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. Poor guy. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. And she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him. How would you like to be, volunteer to be one of the worthless men? Right, And let them bring a charge against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of his city, the elders and the leaders who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people. And the two worthless men came in, sat opposite him, And the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth, curse God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. Then they sent this Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned. He is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, and Ahab rose, Ahab rose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, in the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick up your own blood. Ahab Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my, my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me, and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And any one of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, 
whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. And when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went out dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring the disaster upon his house. How's that for encouragement this morning? That's what you want to read every morning for your daily devotions, right? As we look at this story, you learn, what we can learn is how to better deal with the evil that is within our own hearts and the evil that runs wildly around us as well. And we see especially three lessons that help us to deal with that. And the first one is this, that moping is a slippery slope into sin. Now, he has settled into, and and if you remember, I read two different texts where this is what he did. He just settles into moping around the house. Does anyone here mope around the house? Yes, we do. We have times where we do that, or we mope maybe at the workplace, or maybe we have a friend or a spouse who kind of settles into that. So what is moping? What is it? It is... Maybe illustrated in these pictures, all of us have seen some face like this, or we've made a face like that at some time, right? It's sulking, it's acting depressed and disappointed. And why do we do it? We do it because we don't get our way, or things are not going our way. At the end of chapter 20, the proverb prophet gave Ahab this bad news about the punishment that he and his family would suffer. And it says, he went home, the king of Israel went to his house vexed and sullen, moping around the house. Did you hear about this woman in Wisconsin? Last year, she and her sister and her parents saved their Amazon delivery boxes for six months. Did you hear about this? And then on April Fool's Day, Maureen Pritchard stacked up all of those boxes in front of their house, so that when her husband came home from work, he would see that. (laughs) Now, that's a great prank, right? Because many of us here can identify with the pain of the husband because there are a number of us who maybe just every day once in a while love to have that package show up at the door. Amazon is so easy, right? We need a little pick-me-up, so we go online and do a little shopping, right? I just need to look. Just let me, and I do this sometimes. I just as a little distraction for a while, I'll go to a, uh, some, I'll, okay, I'll say it. I go to Cabela's, <laughs> all right? And just look for a little while. And, and then you buy something. Or if you don't buy it, you know how they come back and say, are you still looking interested in this, right? They do that. This is what we see from Ahab in our chapter 21. He decided he needed some more stuff as well. And he set his sights on Naboth's vineyard. And the key here is that Naboth does not need that vineyard at all. He has more vineyards than he could ever use. But he's convinced that this one will make him happy. Now, if you look at the text, you might think Naboth is just being stubborn. Why doesn't he give it to him? He, he could get a nicer vineyard. He could get cash have, have, you know, for whatever he wanted to do. But for Naboth, God had promised to Abraham that he would inherit a land. His people would inherit a land, and this strip of land was the fruit of God's salvation. It was God's specific gift of grace and his provision for the future of Naboth and his family particularly. 
It had been divided to all of them, to all of these families, years ago. As well as it says, Naboth says in verse 3, God had commanded that the land was to remain in the hands of the families to whom it was first allotted. It was part of what God had commanded. This land as well also really belonged to God since it was a redemptive act of God that provided this land. You could lease the land for a time, but God commanded that provision should always be made for redemption of the land, buying it back so that it could be always returned to the original family. This is God's design. And so in verses 5 and 6, since Ahab can't have the land, he goes moping around the house again, and he's moping so intensely he won't even eat. He's not showing up at the dinner table. And he is sliding down the slippery slope into sin. Now, James 4 describes a bit of how this develops for us. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. So fights and conflicts and even murders come from your sinful desires. And there's something that you want, something you're not getting. And if I don't get what I want, I will be moping around the house. Do we do that? We do that sometimes. I do it sometimes. And you know what? It's sick. It's selfish. It's sinful. Whenever you and I go moping, we are on a slippery slope of sin because our selfish desires are going unmet. Proverbs 14, verse 14. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. So discontentment spiritually kills you. On the other hand, contentment over and over throughout Scripture is a sign of spiritual life. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says, Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So one question that we ask is, how well do you sleep at night? Because sometimes it's related to this. When you're not sleeping well, it's because you are wanting something or maybe losing something that really, really is not essential for life. Paul in 1 Timothy provides another way to understand the slippery slope. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So here's the thing that we need to look for in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. Our sinful nature drives us to want more and to get our own way. Back in 1993, filmmaker Woody Allen, some of us know that name pretty well, he tried to explain his controversial affair with the young daughter of Mia Farrell, And he provided this crazy line, classic line. He says, the heart wants what it wants. Got to have it. Moping is a sign that you are spiritually sick and sliding down into sin. And the question is, how sick are you sometimes with wanting more? Did you know that back in the 70s, we used to see or hear about 500 ads per day? Now it is estimated average maybe about 5,000 ads per day, really. And they say up to 10,000, depending on how much time you spend online, etc., And all of those ads are working to make you discontented so that you will want what they have. And there is one central message from all of it, and that is we can give you true happiness and deep satisfaction if you get this. 
churches years ago used to be the center of a community, and then it moved over to shopping malls as being the center of the community. Now those are passing, a, more of a past thing, and so now they are being replaced by uh, simply a smartphone in the comfort of our home. Since 1973, the average household size decreased from 3.5 to 2.5 people. How do you get three and a half people in a house? I don't know, right? 3.5 to 2.5 people, yet American homes have exploded in their size from the average of 1660 square feet, 1,660 square feet, to, I think it's 2015, they've added, we've added more than 1,000 square feet. So that now it's 2,690 square feet. And now, since that time, since 2015, they have shrunk a bit. At the same time, self-storage space has grown exponentially to 2.3 billion square feet in America. One in every 10 households rents a storage unit, and there is now more than seven square feet of storage space for every man, woman, and child in the country. And here's one more. In order to pay for all of these desires, and now with inflation on top of it all, families are falling deeper into debt. So here's some questions in light of all the above. What do you mope about? What are you not getting that maybe sometimes can turn you ugly? Is there a job or a position at work that you're not getting? Is there something that you don't get with your spouse maybe and you start moping? Or what do you most kind of get ugly or fight about? And kids, this is for all of us. What are you moping about? How sick are any of us with wanting more? And here's what I challenge every one of us to do. Ask a friend, ask a spouse, where do you see me moping, dissatisfied, discontented? And will you hold me accountable in this area? Help me with this. So that's a, that's a first lesson. The second lesson that we want to learn here, well, first of all, before we start, is anybody married to a Jezebel? No, don't answer that. Right? Here's why this is important. Jezebels drag you down into the sewer. And I'm going to give you an image here. My mom is here for the weekend, and so she will corroborate this story, ask her afterwards. When I grew up on, a, on the farm in Iowa, since we always had cattle, we are always on the search for hay. Uh, and one source of hay was the grass that would grow into the very large ditches that were around our home. And I would often, and I was the one who was very often mowing those ditches and driving on the steep slopes of those ditches. One time I actually escaped death as a tractor rolled over and I just escaped out of the seat just as that seat crushed into the ground. Bailing ditches would involve first mowing the grass, and then it, you, then you had to rake it, and then bale it, and you're doing that very often on a steep uh, incline. For us, the ditch out in front of our house served as the outlet for the septic tank sewage from our home. You know where I'm going with this, maybe? Guess where the grass grows, the greenest and the tallest? And so we would work to harvest that lush, tall, green grass. And in order to cut, rake, and bale that good grass, I'm riding on the slope right along the edge of this deep furrow of sewage. And more than once over the years, 
the tractor's rear wheel, I got a little too close. And it would get sucked down into this deep rut of repulsive muck, even to the point of getting stuck on this open-wheeled tractor. And the stench of that muck had been tolerably unpleasant until that moment. But now with that tractor wheel spinning, there is this vile stench that is exploding into the air. All of that to say this, that moping puts you on the slippery slope of sin and Jezebels drag you down into the sewer of sin. Think about the influence that Jezebel has here. She has two choices with Ahab. One is, you know what? You need to grow up here. Get over it. You're moping over something that's ridiculous. You can't have everything that you want. If anybody needs to be told something like that, hang out with my wife. She's told me this, these things a number of times, right? We need that. But instead, she chooses to affirm him in his selfish pining and pulls him down further into this sewer of evil. Verse 7, she says, you know, you're right. You deserve to get this. You have a right to be happy. And I'm going to help you. Verse 25 says she was a spouse that incited him. She stirred him up. So Jezebel murders Naboth, Naboth by arranging for him to be falsely accused. He's thus wrongly convicted of the crime, taken out city, outside the city gates, killed. She breaks the news to Ahab. He immediately goes down to take possession of the vineyard that he wanted so badly. And here's what we need to see. A Jezebel nurtures you toward and drags you down into the stench of sin. So let me ask you again, are you married to a Jezebel? Or let me ask it to you in a different way. Do you have friends that are Jezebels? Or do you sometimes serve as a Jezebel? What do you do when a fellow student is being mocked or maybe attacked by another student? Do you intervene to stop it? Or do you join in by encouraging it or just ignoring it? What's your response when a coworker complains about the company or the boss? What's your response when a friend has some gossip or complains about church or about someone else or about anything? Do you extinguish or add fuel to the fire of sin or discontentment? Do you tell them that they need to stop it? Some people are looking for a Jezebel who will affirm them in their selfish misery. Throughout Scripture, in marriage and in relationships, we are instructed to stay away from relationships that will tear us down rather than build us up. And so one example of this is found especially in Ephesians 4, verse 29, 15 through 16. In marriage and in friendships, we are always charged with nurturing others toward faith, truth, and godliness. That's our call in relationships. Choose your friends wisely and be a good friend who nurtures toward faith. Sometimes you just need to speak truth and say, you know what, you're crazy here. You need to get over this. You need to move on. Your attitude is ugly and, and, and you're getting uglier. Finally, let's think about a third lesson that helps us to deal with sin and evil in our lives. And that is that this, justice will be done. God is in the business of justice. And it will be executed perfectly and completely. Verse 16, Ahab and Jezebel complete their sinful acts by taking the possession. Verses 17 through 24, God sends Elijah as a messenger of his, of his justice. He said, basically, because you have sold yourself to do evil, because you have chosen your sinful desires, I am provoked to anger, 
and you will suffer the penalty for your sin. You and your children will suffer horribly. Shame will accompany the deaths of you and your children as you all become food for the dogs. It's horrible. God's wrath, and you see this over and over throughout Scripture, it rightly burns against sin. N.T. Wright, one of the church's greatest theologians, um, written many, many books, and he said this, the biblical doctrine of God's wrath is rooted in the doctrine of God as the good, wise, and loving creator who hates, yes, hates and hates implacably anything that spoils, defaces, distorts, or damages his beautiful creation, and in particular, anything that does that to his image-bearing creatures. If God does not hate racial prejudice, he is neither good nor loving. If God is not wrathful at child abuse, he is neither good nor loving. If God is not utterly determined to root out from his creation in an act of proper wrath and judgment, the arrogance that allows people to exploit, bomb, bully, and enslave one another, he is neither loving nor good nor wise. So why is that so important? Why is God's perfect justice so important for us today? There's a couple of reasons for sure. And one is that because we will all suffer, some of us have over and over already, we will all suffer injustice like Naboth. And we want to know that things will be made right again. Sometimes obedience to God ends in tragedy. But God will not let violence done to his people go unpunished. He will judge those who trample upon the upright. 1 Kings 21, verse 20, Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, my enemy? See, before God, nothing remains hidden and nothing remains unpunished. Paul warned the church at Rome. He said, Beloved, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We've all been on the receiving end of some injustice. I have a number of times someone has wounded us, maybe with their words or actions, and there will be more. And the question is this, have you learned, will you learn that when you are wronged, to leave vengeance to God. When your house or your life gets ransacked, when you are abused, when you are treated unfairly at work, when kids pick on you, God says, vengeance is my business. I will take care of it. Now, there's a second reason that God's perfect justice is so important for you and me, and that is that we are all sinners with a resume. Actually, it's pretty similar to Ahab's and Jezebel's. Our sin as well is a stench in God's nostrils, and his perfect justice demands that we suffer the same judgment, a shameful death. But at the same time, praise God that he is also in the business of mercy. And what we know is that throughout Scripture, it is revealed in multiple ways that Jesus willingly set aside his position as judge in heaven to suffer injustice on earth. And he was ransacked. He was horribly violated, the perfect man wrongly condemned so that we who are rightly condemned could become perfect. And Jesus absorbed his father's wrath so we could receive our father's acceptance and love. And he suffered the calamity of hell itself so that we could gain redemption and the promised land of heaven. So there is justice, 
but it's visited upon him on our behalf. Naboth, his promised strip of land, it was stolen away from him. But what scripture makes clear is that we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Amen? Never be taken away. No matter what comes your way, that's ours. One of the lessons of that long list of kings that we saw earlier is that everyone and everything will always somehow disappoint, somehow often take away from you. Ahab was one more king who would take and take and even sacrifice you for his endless desires. We see this today with politicians. We see it uh, as they are repeatedly exposed as those who sacrifice the community for the sake of their endless desires for power and for wealth. This happens in our workplaces as well, even in the church. And what we need to re remember is that Jesus is the only king and servant leader who has sacrificed himself for the sake of the community, for us. In Psalm 73, the author sees and envies, and he wants all the great prosperity of others. And then it says he came to his senses and saw how it all really, I see now, it just really just slips away. They enjoy it maybe for a time, but it, it all just slips away. It can be destroyed in a moment. In verse 22, and I was looking at all of that and envying that and wanting that. He says, I was like a stupid beast. But then this is what I saw. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Amen? Everything can be stripped away. Or the psalmist in 63 wrote, because your love is better than life, a little bit later he says, my soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. And the song goes on to explain that this happens when I remember you, when I meditate on you. We need to keep those gospel truths washing through our minds, moping and wanting more. It fades when you celebrate Jesus as your treasure. It's one of the reasons we're here again this morning. And finally, at the end of this text... There's another reason why we can stop wanting more and ultimately be satisfied with God. If you look at verse 27 through 29, you and I would gladly let Ahab suffer the consequences. But here's what God does. God cannot resist our humble repentance. Who can ignore the cries for help from a child? We deserve God's justice, but our repentance and our faith, it opens, they open the floodgates of his mercy. The psalmist in 34 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And so when we humble ourselves before our great king, we can go out in the joy of his mercy and his love that has brought him to the point of offering himself for us. We do live in an R-rated, horrible, horribly evil, ugly world sometimes. But in the midst of all the evil and the fear and the chaos, you can revel in a beautiful relationship with a king who is passionate for your joy. Real joy, not the temporary joy, real joy, giving you eternal and infinite riches, all of it from his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for 
the way that in the midst of all this crazy evil and injustice in our world, we see our Savior who suffers injustice for us, taking our place so that we can have hope for what is really eternal, what is really infinitely valuable. We thank you for your provision, for the inheritance that is ours. We thank you for the love that is revealed through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.